Now to wrap up the architecture and design piece, you have to be aware and proficient with cryptographic designs, assets, and different types. Cryptography deals with encryption and encryption simply put is putting information in a way to where it's hidden, where someone can't see it unless they're supposed to see it. So you put a, a scramble of a bunch of different words or letters, numbers or symbols, and you put it in a way that only the actual source and destination can read it, right? So only people that can decipher it supposedly should be the person that you're trying to send it to. So you need to make sure that you understand different types of hashes, different types of encryptions to know, okay, this is a strong encryption. This is a weak encryption. This is the strengths of this type of encryption. This is the weaknesses of this type of encryption. So to wrap up architecture and design one more time, you need to figure out and understand different types of cryptographic assets. Now the third major domain that we need to cover and talk about for the exam and as I always say to boil over into real life is actual implementation of the things that we talked about. And the first thing that you need to implement, the first thing that you need to be aware of is different types of secure protocols. So the internet runs off a bunch of different protocols. Email runs off a bunch of different protocols. Now being specific to cybersecurity, you need to be hyper aware of the secure protocols because some protocols are not secure, which are no bueno. Other protocols all secure, which you should always try to use whenever possible. So when it comes to implementation, you have to be aware of secure protocols, when to use them and how to set up these protocols to work properly. Because sometimes with protocols and security, you may actually take away some of the functionality, right? So you gotta make sure that you have a happy balance of confidentiality, security, and functionality. Because it's cool if it's secure, but if the shit don't work, nobody's gonna care. Now talking about implementation, you have to figure out how to implement things for the host and whatever the application that the host is gonna be using, right? So you gotta figure out security for the host and the actual application. Now, this is mostly gonna be done through hardening, right? So basically trying to take away as many vulnerabilities, trying to make the application and the user as secure as possible. So having endpoint protection at the actual device, having security at the physical location, actually having security on the actual network, whether it's antivirus, whether it's firewalls, whether it's intrusion detection, how to make the host secure, which a lot of times is through user training, acceptable use agreements, so on and so forth, just to make sure that that person knows exactly how to interact with other individuals and how to be as safe and secure as possible on your network and using your devices, then actually making those devices, systems, organizations, networks as secure as possible. So you have to actually implement those different things. Now, since we in 2022, that's when I'm recording this video, you have to make sure that your wireless network is secure. So I keep on talking about networks and users and hosts and applications. A lot of the things that we're gonna be using is gonna be on a wireless network which can bring on a host of its own problems, right? A myriad of its own problems. So you have to make sure that your wireless network is secure, that it doesn't have a super broad range that somebody from across the street can actually be on your network, that it's actually secure enough that people can't just connect with random devices, so on and so forth. So you have to implement secure protocols, secure procedures to make sure that the wireless network is just as secure as the wired network. This is gonna be done through the protocols that we talked about earlier. So using WPA2 instead of WEP, making sure that the actual Wi-Fi devices are on certain frequencies, that you're using certain channels, so on and so forth. So all the things that we learned before, actually implementing them is gonna be super important when you get out in the real world and it's gonna help you on the actual exam. Now coming along with Wi-Fi comes mobile, right? So you got your Wi-Fi network, then you may actually have a lot of people using their mobile data and their mobile devices. So not only do you have to ensure that things are secure while they're at work, you gotta figure, you gotta figure out how to make things while they're 
on the subway, while they're on the bus, while they're in their car, while they're traveling on vacation, while they're at home. So things like VPNs and those type of things and user training and all these types of things, you have to figure out how to keep someone secure pretty much no matter where they are. If they're using your device, if they're connecting to your organization, there needs to be a way to securely do that and you have to implement that. Next up, we're gonna talk about operations and incident response. So this is super important. So when things do go left, when shit hits the fan, you gotta make sure that people know how to properly respond. We don't just want people running around in circles, crying, sweating, and doing stuff like that. We wanna make sure that people know exactly what to do. Now, one of the things to figure out a baseline, how to actually come up with the operational procedures and figure out how to respond to incidents is something we talked about earlier, is having a proper security assessment, figuring out where the organization is right now and how do we get better at what we need to do. One of the ways that we can do that is by creating a network map and doing a little reconnaissance. So you figure out, okay, how is the actual network set up and how does it actually respond to different stressors, different commands, different things, right? We can do this by using commands such as ping to see, okay, can we actually speak to things on our network and off our network? Let's try trace route to actually trace the route that data takes. What routers does it go to? Does it drop any information? So you have to actually make a network map, do a little recon, see if any files on the server have been manipulated. See if anybody has access to information that they shouldn't have access to. So you have to implement that security assessment to figure out how secure is the network, how secure are the devices, and to ensure that nobody on that network, nobody in the organization has access to files, folders, information that they shouldn't have, both physically and digitally. To ensure that everybody is on the same page during the incident response. That's when a user training is gonna come in and policies, right? So you have policies in place to ensure that everybody knows what to do. So you, have user agreements. So you have somebody sign, hey, you're agreeing to, as a user, this is what you're gonna do on a network, this is what you won't do. Also, another step you could take is an acceptable use policy, right? So this acceptable use policy, or AUP, is ensuring that people understand, hey man, this is what's acceptable on our network, this is what's acceptable in our organization. Anything above and, you know, above and beyond that, you can get fired, you can have discipline actions, so on and so forth. But you gotta have standard operating procedures, you gotta have policies in place, and not just for bad stuff, but like I said, when an incident happens, everybody should know, okay, this is who I call, I disconnect my computer, I do X, Y, Z, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, just to lessen the blow of whatever incident that is, instead of just letting it run crazy. Whenever something happens, everybody, from the smallest guy to the biggest girl should know exactly what to do. Now going along with those are policies that are indicative to an incident response. You also have to have procedures in place to mitigate these things. Okay, when something happens, should we contain things? Should we eradicate them? So on and so forth. You should have a policy and steps and procedures to how to mitigate things. Are we gonna mitigate things through insurance? Are we just going to avoid certain things? You have to have policies, procedures, and steps in place to mitigate these things. So mitigating risks, mitigating vulnerabilities, super important on the exam, super important in real life. Now when an incident does happen, depending on how serious it is, depending on what needs to happen, how we're gonna wrap up incident response handling is digital forensics. So just like in a crime scene, when somebody gets hurt or something happens, they come, they dust for fingerprints, they try and figure out a timeline, see where you were at, so on and so forth. That's the same thing that happens when a crime happens on the internet. Where were you? What device you were using? What cell phone towers did you ping off of? That way we can triangulate your actual space, or your IP address, where you were. Another thing, if you are a troll, right? If you like to make fun of people online, if you are a 
internet bully, which I don't believe in because shit, you can just turn the computer off. But if you do that type of stuff, right, and you think, oh, I'm good, it is super, I'm not gonna show you how, but it is super easy to figure out exactly where you are. I'm talking about house, street, address, everything, right? So if a regular person can do that, the actual people that are paid to do that can do much more. But anyway, going back to digital forensics. So digital forensics actually has, okay, at 801, he had these following his computer. He got in trouble at 815, he deleted them. They can use that against you in court. Or you can use that against whoever in court. So digital forensics is literally using your laptop, the internet, the network as a crime scene, right? So when it comes to digital forensic, we gotta think about chain of custody. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about in the video, if you've never seen it before, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, you can watch some of my old videos, or you can head over to itmagickey.com where people are getting certified in two weeks. So with that being said, digital forensics is super important because it gives you a trail, right? So you got all the info, you got all the information. So if this does have to go to trial, if it does have to go to the next step, you have all of the information that you need to prosecute. The last domain we're gonna talk about is governance, risks, and compliance. So when it comes to this domain, we gotta think about different types of controls. Now some controls are preventative, while others are detective, while others are corrective. So you have to have the proper controls in place to make sure that you are mitigating risks and that you are complying with laws, regulations, protocols, these types of things. So we have to make sure that we have the proper controls in place, like I said, whether it is something that's gonna prevent something, whether it is something that's gonna detect something, or if it's something that's gonna correct something if something goes wrong. You have to make sure they have the proper controls in place. Now, it's super important to know the laws in your state or country and the regulations in your state and country, because that's what's gonna govern your organization overall. And if you don't abide by the laws, don't abide by the regulations, that could definitely affect your security posture and your organization as a whole. Now, when you become the chief security officer or whatever your dream job position or role is, if you don't follow laws, regulations, they ain't gonna wanna hear none of that if anything gets broken. That kind of falls on you. And I'm like, how didn't you know? I don't know isn't going to work. So you just wanna make sure that when you're doing all this stuff that you're not breaking no laws, that you're making sure that you're in compliance with the local government and that you stand in line with the actual protocols, rules, guidelines of your actual organization. You basically don't want to break the rules in any capacity, whether it's locally, federally, or just at your local organization. Now, when it comes to risks, you have to manage them. You have to. Now, depending on the different risks, you may avoid certain risks you may mitigate certain risks or you may transfer certain risks. But as a cybersecurity professional, risk is gonna be a day-to-day -day thing. You have to manage risk. And like I said, you have to do low priority, high priority, high probability, low probability, and just make sure that you're going after the things that are the highest risk with the highest probability and that can have the most catastrophic messed up result if they do happen first and then you will go down the line of importance now hopefully you can have a mitigation technique or some way to deal with every risk on your list but you have to be aware of those risks and do something about it. i want you to do me a favor really fast make sure that you watch my last video which can not only help you with security plus but can help you level up and IT. As I always say, you can head over to itmagickey.com where you can get Security Plus, plus two other of the most popular certifications in the industry in 16 weeks or four months. Other than that, like this video, share with anybody who can benefit from it. And other than that, I'll see you in class.